Hi, I'm Jan Witkowski of uh, Cold Spring Harbour Laboratory. Uh, welcome to the 86th Cold Spring Harbour Symposium on Quantitative Biology. Uh, these began a long time ago in 1931, and with the exception of the war years, they've been held every year. Although, of course, for the past two years, we've had uh, difficulties, which we don't need to talk about. The, the topic of this year's symposium is genome stability and integrity, and I'm delighted to have um, Stephen Jackson from the Gurd Institute in Cambridge, who's going to talk about DNA damage repair. Yeah. How did you get into this, this area, Steve? What was your introduction to it? Well, I think like many scientific uh, developments, uh, it came as a bit of a surprise. I was into my new lab in Cambridge in the early 1990s, working in the, in the field of transcription, and I stumbled across a protein kinase, um, actually during my postdoc years in the US, um, and it dawned on me that this was activated by broken DNA. And uh, I couldn't quite square that with, with the transcriptional roles we were postulating. And so it dawned on me that this might be a DNA repair enzyme and hooking up with certain individuals in the radiation biology field mm -hmm. in those early days allowed me to, to show that DNAPK, as it was called, was a DNA repair enzyme and it, and it set a paradigm for various other things in the DNA damage response field, but also helped my, well, basically launched my lab into that arena where we've been ever since. How many DNA repair pathways are there or systems are there? That's a great question. Um, I think if you look in the textbooks, you, you'll have half a dozen of the, of, of the principal DNA repair pathways. But what we're learning now is that there are crosstalks between them and that a pathway that a few years ago or 10 years ago we were thinking of as a single pathway um, actually bifurcates or triple, tri multiplies into, into different avenues. And I think this highlights um, that our cells, uh, all life, has evolved very sophisticated systems to deal with DNA damage. Mm. And there aren't just strict a few pathways, that there are nuances and that cells root things through the appropriate pathway at the right time and the right place. And so it's more sophisticated than you might expect from just thinking of a right. half a dozen pathways. Yeah, I mean, you, you would actually expect in in an important area like DNA repair, you'd expect redundancy even within the repair pathways, which I suppose is to some extent what what you're describing this, about this crosstalk. Absolutely. P people call it redundancy, but I think it's more resilience. I think biology needs to be robust and things oh, don't yes. always work out perfectly. But if you are a, a robust system, you have other ways of dealing th with things. And I think that's one of the problems that's hit our economies in the, in the COVID arena. It was all very efficient until something went wrong, but there was very little resilience. Biology, good biology is resilient. And I think that's mm -hmm. how organisms have evolved. And, and that's really crucial in the DNA repair area. It sounds to me, as a, or maybe there already is, a, a field of resilience in biology. Absolutely. It's, uh, resilience, I think, is fundamental to, to fundamental processes. And uh, it's actually an area that my lab's getting into right now, initially through the concepts of understanding cancer cells evolving resistance to drugs, which, which may mean that they're rerouting things, um, but also in the realm of genetic diseases as well. It's, mm. it's, it's quite clear that many people with genetic diseases with the same mutation mm. don't necessarily have the same pathology. And that's probably highlighting not just environmental effects, um, but differences in the backgrounds of these patients, which, which may give them more or less resilience. Yes, yeah. Anyway, coming back to DNA. Yeah. Um, I, you've been mentioning cancer, of course. Uh, the relevance of these DNA repair pathways to development of cancer? I'm probably biased, but I think DNA repair and associated pathways are, are just about more important for cancer biology than almost any other field, perhaps every other field. I mean, we know that existing therapies that work effectively, radiotherapies and most chemotherapies, work by inflicting DNA damage. We know that um, inherited defects or acquired defects in DNA repair give rise to mutations, which causes people to develop cancer. Um, and uh, we're increasingly learning that, that these DNA repair pathways provide um, druggable targets that are being exploited by various companies and academics throughout the world to improve cancer therapies. So I think it touches on many areas of cancer biology. And have you been able to, uh, I was going to say the word exploit, I'm not sure I'd like the word exploit, exploit your, your findings in developing of therapies and uh, treatments? 
Yes, I mean, again, it was a, it was a, a series of chance occurrences relatively early in my, on my, in my career. We, we um, worked on enzymes such as DNAPK, which is a protein kinase, and it, it turned out that it was in a protein kinase family for which there were already drug-like molecules. And so that allowed certain um, astute individuals in my group at the time to say, hey, let's think about these as pharmacological tools. And initially we were, we were developing these to try and probe DNA repair pathways in cells. But then we realized that some of these compounds were, were killing certain cancer cells, but, but not others, which suggested that there might be some selectivity and dependencies on these DNA repair pathways across different cancers. Mm -hmm. And that led me um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to conceive the idea of drugging DNA repair and set up a, a, a biotech company uh, to exploit that concept. Um, and to cut a long story short, that company developed a number of compounds, and one of which is now a, a blockbuster drug used to treat uh, various cancers that rely on a BRCA1 and BRCA2 deficiency, uh, basically. Um, and uh, so that was a, a series of chance occurrences leading to a, a drug that's improving people's right. lives throughout the world. Right. You said a moment ago that some of these therapeutic compounds had yep. different, differing effects on different types of cancers or different cancer cells. What, was there a commonality to these, the cells that were affected? That, I mean, that's a fascinating arena that w that's been known about for a long time, that, that certain patients do respond to therapies, others don't. They might have the same cancer, there might, might be two breast cancer patients, but what, what means that one patient or one cancer in one patient will respond, but not another? Uh, and why is it that the cancer that responds in, in a particular patient might become resistant? And I think these have been observations that have been known about for decades. But now in the molecular arena, we are being able to probe more into these uh, cancer cells, different cancer cells, and find out what makes them tick. And so in the concept of, of PARP inhibitors, for example, which my lab's played a role in, in developing, um, it's defects in, in pathways related to a DNA repair pathway called homologous recombination which make them hypersensitive mm -hmm. to PARP inhibitors. And that includes BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, defects in those, but also in others. And so I think we are now moving into this realm where patient, the cancers are not diagnosed from where, where, where they've arisen, but what their molecular fingerprints mm -hmm. are. And, and I think the hope for the future is one, detecting cancer earlier, um, and two, coming up with therapies that are tailored to the individual cancers to make the best chance uh, for successful therapy. So that also then makes me think that there may well be therapies that have, have failed in the past because they've not been applied to cancers with the appropriate molecular signatures, if you like. Uh, that, that's invariably the case. In fact, you know, the drug that my, my company developed um, essentially failed at one stage before it was resurrected because the trial wasn't designed well enough mm. to, to, to ask the right question. And so there must be um, a whole range of, of therapies, not just in cancer, that never made it uh, because the, the, the clinicians didn't know of or didn't apply the right um, stratification, mm -hmm. if you like, on the patients. Uh, and there is prospects, maybe retrospectively, um, uh, raising certain failed drugs from the, from the dead, but, but from a commercial and practical point of view, that's difficult. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Anyway, hopefully on a positive note, going f further in this arena, um, those kind of mistaken trials uh, will become fewer and far mm -hmm. between, more far between. So are you doing any work to explore, well, two ways, I think, to explore, to look for new uh, repair yep. processes and to uh, f explore why what were promising drugs actually fail in the cell, not, not so yep. much as... Yeah. consequence of ill-designed clinical trial. Yeah, um, that, that is an arena of my lab. In, in fact, uh, at, at the conference uh, uh, later on in the week, I'll be talking about um, not our work on trying to identify new drugs, but trying to understand how some of the more ex established chemotherapeutic drugs work. So um, the story I'm going to be highlighting is where we use one um, very well-used um, drug that's been known about for many years called etoposide. Um, it, it targets an enzyme called topoisomerase 2, which comes in various forms, mm -hmm. and, and generates DNA damage. Um, and so this compound has been used in sec successfully in clinical trials for many years, but it doesn't always work, and patients can evolve response, uh, evolve res resistance mm -hmm. to this drug. And so this particular project was to try and identify the molecular uh, features 
i.e. genes uh, in our case, which control the sensitivity and resistance to that um, chemotherapeutic drug. And how are you setting about doing that sort of, that sort of work? So we, we start out with cell lines in culture and uh, say my lab over the last eight years um, have, have really um, integrated into our work uh, CRISPR uh, Cas9 or CRISPR Cas technologies um, and CRISPR genetic screens. So in this particular story that I'm going to be talking about at the conference, um, we, we basically use genome wide CRISPR screens to ask the question which genes in the genome mm -hmm. drive resistance or sensitivity to atopicide. Um, now, we, many people have been working in this field for quite some time, so we weren't surprised to find that many of the g hits that we got from our screens were already known about. Well, that, that's encouraging. That's encouraging. We knew the screen worked. Um, but we were particularly attracted to one particular target that had been sort of seen before but not explored. It's a, it's a, it's a gene uh, called rad 50 L2, and it makes a protein called RAD54L2. And so this particular project was to try and understand how is it that RAD54L2 affects cellular sensitivity to atopicide, because that hadn't been shown before. The, the RADs are a whole family of them, aren't they? The, 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 the Absolutely. Rings are in, in DNA repair. It's Yes, yes. So RAD54 is, is one of the quintessential um, DNA repair factors initially identified in yeast. And, uh, and what often happens is that uh, you identify a, a, a primordial member of, of, of these, uh, th these enzymes and you call its catalytic domain something mm. and then you find that that exists in various forms in a range of other proteins. So there are actually lots of proteins in this broader family and it doesn't necessarily mean they're involved in DNA repair, they're just ATP dependent helicases of a certain class. Um, but it does provide some clues to how it mm. was affecting atopicide sensitivity and, and we say we've explored that in this particular study. And for me, I think the most interesting thing of the study, again, using CRISPR screens followed up by cell biology and, and, and biochemistry, is that this, this, this new factor, if you like, is actually not working with the previously known factors. It's, it's a mm. new way of dealing with topoisomerase, um, which is basically captured in a cleavage right. complex right. on DNA. Um, and, uh, you know, for us, that was, that, was, that was quite cool. It's another way of dealing with topoisomerase DNA damage, different than the previously established mm. pathways. You said something a moment ago that I think you know, struck me as uh, remarkable in, in relation to this drug. Or oh, you, you said something like uh, determining how they work. I mean, it's extraordinary that these drugs are you these cancer drugs are used presumably on, on a, a completely empirical basis uh, without knowing how they work at a mechanistic level. Just to, to start with, absolutely, Jan. I mean, the, the, you know, the, 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 these many of these compounds were identified um, through empirical uh, approaches, but actually, it is it does turn out that that the etoposide, etopoisomerase two poison, actually mm. is pretty it's well characterised. Yeah, yeah. But what we don't really know is we still are exploring precisely how cells deal with that damage um, and damage of a, of, of, a, of a similar nature which is occurring in the absence of this chemotherapeutic because these pathways that we have in our cells haven't, haven't evolved to deal with chemotherapies, they've evolved right. to deal with you know, normally occurring yeah. DNA damage and we're just stressing the system, I guess, with these drugs. So, so from the perspective of this particular work, um, we're explaining how cells respond to this, this compound um, but interestingly, there, there's a potential translational angle because we found that overexpression of RAD54L2 actually causes cells to become more resistant to etoposide, which suggests that overexpression could be a way that s cancers could evolve resistant to this drug. And although uh -huh. we don't know that's occurring, um, there are some clinical outcome data which, which, which indicate that, that, uh, that, that cancers with low expression sorry, with high expression of RAD54L2 are correlated with bad responses in the clinic. So, um, so that could potentially be useful in the future to help tailor uh, these kinds of therapies to the, to, to the patients that are most likely to respond. Well, let's keep our fingers crossed. But the final thing I think oh, sorry, is even more interesting than that is, of course, it, it doesn't really help if you ex 
tell a, a cancer patient why you're not giving them a drug. But um, in the end, could, could we come up with a way of better treating cancers? And so our work also highlights this, this, new, this new factory, if you like, as a potential drug target. It has a catalytic domain. You could imagine developing drugs against that. Mm -hmm. And who knows, um, you know, RAD54L2 could, could potentially be an Achilles heel for certain other subsets of cancers. And maybe one day we'll find out about that. I look forward to that day. Thanks very much, Steve. Great, thanks.